Hello, world. I happen to find myself in Seoul, South Korea, my first time to travel outside of Japan and into another Asian country. I knew virtually nothing a week before going to visit, so the one thing I did was to take a look at Google Maps and scope out the place from the air and the streets. One thing I noticed was the clusters of residential apartment buildings. I also saw some beautiful mountains surrounding the city and a huge river. Since I knew zero about Seoul, I put the word out on the social medias and some kind people agreed to show me around. So here's what I experienced during my one evening, two days, and one morning in Seoul. And by the way, I was going to make this a chronological video, which it'll kind of be, but I'm going to seriously get sidetracked and jump back and forth in time throughout the whole thing. It'll be fine. But we have to start somewhere. So how about at the amazing Incheon airport? Yeah, I'm using Google Translate for all the Korean names because, well, I'm guessing he's better than I am. Incheon. I couldn't really ask for much more of the airport. Beautiful, clean, spacious, modern. Everything from immigration to picking up luggage to exchanging cash to getting Wi-Fi was easy. Although I did get dinged like 5% on the exchange. Finding where the trains were was simple and my next task was to get some tea money. No, no, not this guy. These guys. Once in my hands, I loaded it up at the kiosk and was ready to ride on the public transportation or buy some stuff at the convenience stores. The train system was fantastic. It's quite affordable, especially in comparison to fares around Tokyo. For example, getting into the heart of Seoul from the airport cost me 4,151 using the Airx All Stop train, which sounds like a lot, but it's really about 4 US dollars. Okay, quick pause here. I'll mention money a few times. The quick and dirty way to figure out how much Korean currency is in US dollars is to divide the number by 1,000. Yes, 1,000,000,000. So if you have 5,000 won, that'd be $5. Okay, back to trains. Anyone who has traveled Seoul knows that it's about an hour commute to the heart of the city from the main international airport. Along my ride in, what caught my attention right away was the roads. The width of the roads were a lot more similar to what I saw in my visits to the US than to what I was used to in Japan. For example, let's pause it here. That's 10 lanes in total. In Japan, the biggest expressways I've seen have six, while usually there are only four, two lanes going one way, two lanes going the other. All right, so that's the highways or expressways or whatever you call them. The local roads were even more noticeable to me. In Tokyo, you can find some eight laners every once in a while, but the design usually includes a median. More likely, it's a two or four laner. Honestly, some of the streets in Seoul reminded me a lot of some found in Vancouver in Canada. And also like some cities I visited in the United States. Anyways, to sum it up, coming from Tokyo, I noticed that there were bigger roads and more cars in Seoul. When I got more into the city, the train went underground, and well, the underground is boring footage, so let's just skip forward to getting out and about at night. Now, the point of my trip wasn't to go and party or do the tourist stuff, but because of what I needed to film, which was not actually this video, I ended up staying in the university area of Hongdae, where I'm told the young people like to let loose. Here, check this photo out. Notice anything? My wife did. Arm holding. After she clued me in, I opened my eyes and saw there were public displays of affection all over the place. Yep, PDA all over Seoul. Now depending on where you're from, this may be mild or tame, but coming from Japan, this seemed wild, absolutely wild. Anywho, nice park, fun atmosphere. Lots of people enjoying a night out with friends and lovers. I was getting hungry and needed a bite to eat. Since my only friend in Korea ditched me, thanks D, just joking, wedding anniversaries are important things, I had to try and solve my hunger issue all by my lonesome. I decided to limit my risk and pick a place with picture menus. Now I heard Koreans were fairly decent at English and I was in a university part of town, so I decided to simply say the name of the menu item. Number one, aged beefsteak. What I got back was a blank stare. <laughs> but hey, that's why the picture menu, so I pointed at it and it was all good. I did do a couple hours of language study, but out of all that time, the only thing I could say was Kamsahamnida, which I think means thanks, but who knows if any Koreans understood me when I'd mutter it. And I know you're wondering. No, I don't think it was the number one aged beefsteak in Seoul, but I will say that within that building, 
Sure, I'll give them that. After eating, I went to some different areas, these much more party-like. I noticed so many things, but to keep this video from going off the rails, I'll just talk about one of them right now. Street food and street vendors. It was a nice atmosphere and so much stuff that you could easily buy while walking the streets. Come to think of it, I only ever filmed people getting it. I didn't actually try any myself, but I'm sure it was all good. Okay, off to bed. I woke up and during the day I did the thing that I came to Seoul to do. So we're gonna skip right to the night, where I did have some locals to show me the ropes. First stop was Korean barbecue. Alcohol and meat sounds like a fun time. Yeah, got that whole Asian flush thing. What? You've never heard of it? Thanks to my DNA, alcohol makes my skin turn red. It's called Asian flush, and it affects about 36% of Northeast Asians, with higher rates among Asian Americans. Yep, so no drinks for me, but it was fun to watch. <laughs> the meat, on the other hand, was great. It's the perfect thing for those of us on the low-carb diet. Now, I've been to Korean barbecue in Canada as well as in Japan, but it's fun to experience the real thing in Korea. Of course, Korean food in Korea is good. After that, I was going to go home, but somehow another friend joined and I was off to a pub inspired by old school Korea. The ladies prepared makgeolli, which is an unfiltered rice wine. You can see how it's cloudy. Since this is an old school bar, they use these golden bowls, which is reminiscent of what was used over a half century ago. And because you had makgeolli, you also need to get hajeon, which is a savory pancake. There was also naengmyeon, which are thin chewy noodles in a cold vinegary broth. Of course, the ever useful scissors were used again. The food, all good. I had to try a bit of makgeolli, Asian flush or not. Come on. Come on. Okay, good morning. I showed up earlier than when I was to meet a couple fine folks, or really, kids to my eyes, so I decided to take a stroll through the enticing gates at Doksugung. I had a chance encounter with this group. This was the changing of royal guards, by the way. I found it quite fortuitous, as it seems they had an eager following. To get my shots, I didn't even have to run around like a groupie. Lucky me. Another type of group I encountered were students. Some of them were having discussions in English, so I'm assuming they were from the United States coming for culture studies. That'd be a cool experience for a Korean American. I believe most students were coming from within Korea though. In any case, not a bad field trip to take. After leaving the palace gates, I met up with my first set of tour guides, Jonas and Yeonju. I was expecting to solely go by subway and foot, but instead, I was told that taxi would be the best way to quickly get where we were going. Taxis in Tokyo can be pricey, so it was welcome news to hear that taxis in Seoul are quite affordable, starting at 3,000 won for the first two kilometers. <laughs> Where we headed to was an area in Nagwondong. It's full of small little alleyways and chic restaurants. Apparently, it's not a foreign tourist hotspot quite yet, but it is popular among the locals. It's taken an old area and made it hip with stylish cafes and shops. And then, it was time for lunch. No, we didn't eat at this shop, which is making mandu. We went to the more geriatric area, just a few blocks over. That's where I noticed this. I was pretty sure what was going on, but I had to ask to confirm. Yep, this random stuff on the road was saving parking spots. In fact, I had encountered scenes like this in my first night in the city. Kind of like how someone in Philadelphia will call savesies after they shovel the snow away. Except in Seoul, this seems to be happening without the snow. But back to our meal. I'll let one of my tour guides Yeonju. explain what we're about to eat. Okay, so this is called noodle. Yeah. Like there's two versions with broth and non-broth that we get the one with the broth. And this has vinegary and 
like cold flavor. Usually it's really chewy, so you have to chop it up with the scissors before you eat it. Koreans do the cross, like this. One way this, one way this. This is manja. I think it's same equivalent to gyoza in Japan, but when this is more steamed one. This one is kimbap. It's similar to sushi rolls, like maki. Pickled radish and what do you call it? Like some green salad and the most famous Korean dish, kimchi, the fermented cabbage one. Next on the itinerary was going back to the west side of town to Mangwondong. Now we're standing at the entrance toward the Mangwon Market and this is close to World Cup Stadium. So like until 3-4 years ago, one celebrity like put this area on his show. This place was quite bad. But he revived this place and the market got famous with a lot of foods and like snacks. So a lot of people visit during weekends but for dates and family. I was told this market was made by the Japanese way back when. It makes sense as the overhead structure is very similar to what I've seen in Japan. For example, this is an arcade in Esaksa in Tokyo. However, the atmosphere is completely different. Whereas in Japan, vendors sell their wares mostly in shops, you can see here that the goods really bleed into the streets. It reminds me a bit of the shops I'd see in Chinatowns. Some vendors will be selling directly from the farm, so it's kind of a farmer's market as well. This store is where they sell kimchi, the most famous Korean food. And they also have salted uh, side dishes that you can eat everything. They put it in a gochujang, which is the red paste that all the Korean dishes use. And they put salt, soy sauce, everything. And you eat it with rice and it's really good. Like Korean people love to eat with their dishes. One of the things that visitors writing about the area seem to do is try and sample the large variety of food along the way. I did partake in a few samples, but I was so busy filming and had only so many hours in the day, so I sadly didn't take too much time to stop and taste everything. I'd recommend spending more than the 30 minutes that I did and to come with an empty stomach. Despite some taxi rides, I did find myself traveling on the Seoul metro system again. I found it quite easy to navigate. The main system in Seoul proper is Seoul Metro, which has nine color-coded lines. Every time you get on the metro, it's only 1,251 with a team money card for up to 10 kilometers, which is incredibly cheap at just over one US dollar. Every station I visited had protective walls, which was very nice to see. In Tokyo, many stations don't have this, and every year there are many accidental deaths. One thing that was hard for me not to notice was the relief goods storage area and the smoke masks. On some of the video screens, they also had a depiction of what to do in the case of emergency, like a fire in the train. I had heard that the trains can be loud with people talking, and yes, people do talk on their phones at times, but it's much more quiet and orderly than public transit I've taken in Vancouver. And out of the five or six trains I caught, volume levels didn't seem that drastically different from those in Tokyo trains. Although I will say, the Seoul metro system has way more video screens. Now, I really wanted to see inside different types of housing while in Seoul. I'm a creeper, what can I say? But seriously, it's something that a tourist wouldn't get the chance to do and I want it to be more like a local. I totally failed in this regard, but I did get to know a little bit about the different types of housing. That's because my next local guide, Peter, who's an architect, was able to share a few things with me. These buildings are office tells, which are rooms that you can rent for business, but that also have amenities like a small kitchenette so that some people actually end up also living where they work. Besides them, and perhaps hard to distinguish, are the regular housing. This area is really close to the old palace walls, 
So right after you get past the skyscrapers, you get these little houses crammed on a hill. You may have noticed that some of these are falling apart. Why is that? I was told that some of these types of areas were redeveloped into clusters of skyscrapers, like this. Well, this area was on its way to doing so, so why upkeep your place if it's going to be torn down and redeveloped? Like I said earlier, this is right near the historical palace walls, so redevelopment plans have been halted by the current Seoul city mayor. So this resident over here was telling us all about it and how many of the homes in front of him have been abandoned. Others have decided to not play the waiting game and simply renovated their homes. And over the other side of the hill we encountered this completely redeveloped area. If you use Google Maps on satellite view, you can see these groups of towers can be found all throughout Seoul. In between towers, I have to say that it's a very pleasant place to walk through. There are amenities such as parks dotted all around. And here's cafe seating sans the cafe. I was told that some of these trees are very expensive imports from other areas. Quite a different feel from the older areas of Seoul. And what does an old housing area look like? Well, like this. So the brick building in the back is where the most like Korean people live with their family. Uh, it has one floor is for one house and it's called Pilla in Korean and they're really old so if you go inside it's really uh, what do you call the pipe and bathroom, kitchen, everything is so old like authentic Korean living room. This is the one type of housing unit I was able to get into, as my guide Jonas was residing in one. Here's a quick tour for all you curious people. I don't okay. even have a bed frame because it was sold out when I went to Ikea to buy it, so I've just never bought it since then. I noted three things that I didn't see in Japan or Canada. First was the bathroom. Yes, the bathroom with no shower stall or tub. So when it gets wet, it gets wet everywhere. A wet bathroom. People, I tried really hard to see a more spacious and modern bathroom. I hear they exist. But what I saw in another home was similar. An all-in-one bathroom with no separation between the shower, toilet, and sink. So that water would go down a drain and you need to wear slippers so as not to get your feet wet. But hey, I did get some video of a more modern bathroom. They do exist. The second difference is the closed-in balconies. Most balconies in Japan may have a roof, but it's generally open air for drying clothes. Even on the fancy new residential buildings in Japan, it'll be like this. These old apartment blocks in Seoul have these enclosed balconies. Lastly, the third big difference is the roofs. In these old buildings, it appears everyone has roof access. I did a terrible job filming, but there was a little garden as well as racks for drying laundry. Now you might have noticed evening was starting to fall, but I actually skipped ahead a bit. So let me rewind back a little. Before I went to see what some of the old housing was like, I found myself back in the area of Hwangwamun. In the distance, you can see Hwangwamun Gate, which is the entrance to Cheonggyecheon, the royal palace whose name means it's a palace greatly blessed by heaven. I didn't get in too many other areas to travel to and through, like the Yeongdong. This stream used to be covered by concrete until when in 2003, a project was undertaken to tear down an overpass and restore the stream. While the walk along the stream is gorgeous today, it actually didn't look like this before when it was covered in concrete in 1958. In 1904, it looked like this. After the Korean War in the 1950s, it was home to makeshift houses and was a bit of an eyesore. In any case, it's a lovely walk and the stream helps keep the temperatures down. It's too bad that I could only spend about 30 minutes here before moving on to the next spot, which was Yeongdong. I really only stopped here as it was on the way to somewhere else we were going. It's apparently a very touristy market. And I'm told that if you're looking for something more authentic, you go to one like previously shown. Next stop, Itaewon. First, we had to catch a short bus ride to the area. We actually traveled right through this mountain to get here. Itaewon is the big foreign area in Seoul. There's a large US military base that's next to it called Yongsangiji. It has been scheduled for years to be converted to a big park like Central Park in New York, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I just wanna see this 
This is a lively area, and even on the streets, it kind of feels like you're in the club. Food, yes, I'm into having food, is what 50 Cent said. Something that caught my eyes was the big open windows and seating. I could see everyone eating, from the outside. This is not just an Itaewon, but in all the areas I visited. Most restaurants I see in Japan seem more closed off and intimate. While this area clearly has foreign influence, I felt that way about a lot of areas I visited. Some things were Chinese, some American, and some Japanese. I was actually surprised by the number of US fast food chains I could see, from KFC to Dairy Queen. Itaewon didn't just have a US presence. There was also a prominent Muslim section of town as well. All in all, an interesting mix of cultures in the area. We ended up the night at a restaurant that served a variety of side dishes that you might find made in a family home. I didn't even ask my guide to explain all of them, as that'd be an entire video in and of itself. And surprise, surprise, again, the food was good. Okay, so it's my last day in Seoul, and I finally got to the Han River, the massive river that bisects the city into the north and south. I'd been traveling around the north side, so it was nice to get to see the south a bit. This part of town is actually an island in the Han River, and is Seoul's main finance and investment banking district. What I saw yet again was motorbikes, which I had witnessed zooming all over town. I thought Tokyo had a lot of motorcycle deliveries, but I was sorely mistaken. I really wanted to get a delivery. I was told it was a popular thing to get chicken delivered while enjoying the waterfront along the Han River. Alas, this was not to be this time around. Something else I could see in the area were older style apartment buildings. The numbering was similar to what I've seen with public housing in Japan, so I'm assuming it was public housing, but I honestly don't know if this was the case. So my guide for this morning was to show me the river park here, where it's usually hustling and bustling on the weekends. Quite a different scene during the weekdays though. Something that I wasn't expecting to see was a high number of road bikes and a low number of city bikes. In Japan, near everyone rides basic bikes, from mums with their kids to grandpas out and about. I somehow figured it'd be the same in Seoul, but it turns out that biking is a much more serious thing over here, kind of similar to where I used to be from in Vancouver. The day before, I had experienced fantastic weather, but today was not to be the same. While it was forecast to be sunny later in the morning, the fog never seemed to lift. My guide told me that if the fog hadn't lifted by late morning, it was actually smog and not fog. One of my guides the day before had told me that many in Seoul are now learning to monitor the air quality through apps. It's so much easier to see what's happening in the air when you can see the flow compiled from weather data. And with that, it was time to rush off to the airport, but not before I had one last thing to eat. This time we went to a mall, which I think was the most non-distinct building I had visited in all my time in Korea. It could have been any mall in North America or Japan that I visited. Of course, the food court was a bit different though. We did try ordering on a touchscreen, but it turns out we need cards, but I only have Samsung Pay. Oh, so you can't yeah. even order. Yeah. I think this was the meal with the least amount of dishes that I had had so far. A big thanks to all those that showed me around Seoul, and apologies to those I wasn't able to meet up with. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. Have you ever lived in or visited Seoul before? What was your experience like? I'm tired.